Okay, so it's 12.01. Uh, folks are still joining, uh, but in the interest of time, I think we'll get going. So welcome everyone to our webinar today, Parenting a Child with ADHD. Our presenter today is Dr. Randall Gillis from the BC Children's Hospital Provincial ADHD Clinic. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Horn, and I'm the Program Manager for the BC Children's Kelty Mental Health Resource Centre. Before we begin, I would just like to respectfully acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I also wanted to provide a very brief overview of the Kelty Center before we begin. So we're a provincial mental health and substance use resource center, and we assist families across the province by helping with understanding and navigating the mental health system, listening and offering peer support from parent peer support workers through a collaboration with Family Smart, and also connecting families to resources and tools. We will put our contact information back up at the end of the presentation, so no need to copy it down now. So this webinar is a part of a webinar series that's a collaboration between the Kelty Mental Health Resource Center and the Provincial ADHD Program at BC Children's Hospital. So today we're doing Parenting a Child with ADHD, as you know, and next week's webinar is focused on supporting children with ADHD at school. So registration for that one has um, now closed, uh, that one's full, but all of these webinars are being recorded and are available on our website at keltymentalhealth.ca slash ADHD webinar series. Uh, the slides and recording from today's webinar will be available from this link by March 3rd, so next week. Uh, you'll also receive an email with this link tomorrow, so no need to copy this down either. We'll, we'll send it to you by email. A few housekeeping notes before we begin as well. So as mentioned um, on the first slide, everyone is automatically muted and your cameras are turned off so we can't see or hear you. You will have an opportunity to ask Dr. Gillis questions after the presentation. So please submit any questions through the Q&A icon you'll see at the bottom of your screen. There has been an option enabled where you can vote for questions that have been asked by others that you would also like to see answered, as well as an option to submit questions anonymously. If you have any technical questions, such as having issues with your audio or any comments for the panelists, uh, please submit those through the chat icon. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up, and we would really appreciate your feedback so that we can improve uh, future webinars uh, that will also be sent out to you tomorrow in the email. Uh, and we also lastly just wanted to note that the information in this webinar applies to the context in British Columbia. So if you do live in another jurisdiction, please consult with your local health authority for further information. Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So Dr. Randall Gillis is a registered psychologist who works in the Provincial ADHD program at BC Children's Hospital. She has been involved in conducting research, assessment, treatment, and teaching related to ADHD. She has a particular interest in teaching parents evidence-based strategies to support their children with ADHD and co-leads the parenting group in the Provincial ADHD program. She's a clinical instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia and also works part-time in private practice. So thank you so much, Dr. Gillis, for joining us today, and I'll now pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I would also like to start out by acknowledging with respect and gratitude that I live and work on the beautiful unceded Coast Salish traditional territory, and I give thanks to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. So my plan for today includes discussing what makes parenting a child with ADHD unique, an introduction to mindfulness and parenting, going through specific behavioral parenting strategies, and sharing some resources, and then leaving some time for questions at the end. So just to note that I will not be going over the more basic information about what ADHD is, as this has been addressed in the previous talks in our series. So I would encourage you to watch these as well if you haven't already. So I'm going to be talking about many different strategies today, and these are the textbook evidence-based recommendations, but I know that life often makes it difficult and sometimes impossible to implement these in the way that I'm going to talk about. And some strategies will work for you, while others won't. So I challenge you just to try to set out maybe one or two SMART goals based on the information that you hear today. And I, what I mean by this is to make a goal that is specific, measurable, 
attainable, relevant, and time-based. So for example, instead of saying, I'm going to be a better parent, say, I will practice 10 deep breaths with my child each night at bedtime, starting tonight, and I will set an alarm to remind myself to do this. Okay, so I want to start out by acknowledging that there are a number of challenges to parenting a child with ADHD that go beyond the symptoms themselves. So there are often co-occurring conditions, skills deficits like executive functioning deficits as Dr. Chan discussed in his talk, and sensory processing difficulties which our occupational therapist Miranda Doherty focused on in her talk, as well as impairments in everyday routines, uh, parenting characteristics such as parental ADHD, as well as daily hassles like having more appointments to attend or social pressures. So with that in mind, it is important to recognize that regular parenting strategies just aren't enough for children with ADHD. Instead, you need to be super parents. So not only do you need to have a black belt in behavioral parenting strategies, which I will be going over in more detail later, uh, but you also need something in addition to this. So you need mindfulness skills. Now, I wanted to address this first because learning to incorporate mindfulness into your day-to-day -day parenting is really important foundation for the other tools that we're going to be talking about later. And when I talk about mindfulness, I'm not referring to formal meditation necessarily. Instead, I mean taking yourself kind of out of the past or the future and into noticing what is happening in the present moment non-judgmentally. So how is being mindful different from our regular way of being? Well, we all have that experience of going into autopilot and traveling into the past or the future instead of the present, and for example, driving home and all of a sudden realizing that we're in the driveway. Instead of this, we want to challenge ourselves to step out of that automatic pilot and be present at various times throughout our day. And this can be with daily activities, you know, for example, really noticing what it's like to take that first sip of coffee in the morning, focusing on the smell, the taste, how our body reacts to that first hit of caffeine. And practicing this skill of mindfulness helps to increase the likelihood of responding with intention to our children and reduce the likelihood of reacting impulsively to our children's sometimes frustrating behaviors. If we're more present, we're more able to notice where we are at and maybe know that we need to take a deep breath to calm ourselves down, allowing us to better understand where our child is coming from and that maybe they're not being annoying on purpose. So to illustrate how this practice of mindfulness over time might help us in the long run, I have a video from the Headspace app. Um, so I'll just play that for you now. Imagine you're walking down a street. It's a street you know well, maybe one you walk down every single day. But you're so caught up in your own thinking, wondering what you're going to have for lunch, thinking back to a conversation you had earlier, that you end up falling down a hole. Now at the bottom of this hole, you find yourself thinking, how did I end up here? Worse yet, the next day, you do the exact same thing. And then again, the next day, may not sound like an especially cheerful idea, but as an analogy for the mind, it's really helpful. Because so often, we follow the same habits of mind over and over again. And so we find ourselves in an emotional hole, maybe even a place that's really painful. But imagine if you started just noticing, being more aware of your surroundings. Sure, maybe next time you'd realize a little too late and you'd still end up in the hole again. But maybe the time after that, you'd notice the hole and choose to walk around it instead. This is what it means to train the mind. This is what it means to have headspace. Okay, so you can see how practicing being in the moment might be helpful in helping you to step out of some of your unhelpful parenting habits. So let's try a brief mindfulness uh, exercise together. So I'm going to ask you to stop whatever you're doing, maybe even sitting and taking furious notes about all the important things I've said so far, or maybe you've been distracted by that work email that popped up, or you decided to multitask and clean your place while listening. So just stop whatever you're doing and take one deep breath with me. So I want you to breathe in for four seconds. 
Hold for four seconds. And breathe out for four seconds. Now, take a moment to observe what is happening around you. For me, I've uh, kind of been noticing <laughs> that there's a little bit of something digging into me on my chair, so I'm just going to take a moment to readjust myself. Um, and then, after I've kind of done that, I may be feeling a little bit more ready to proceed with the rest of the talk without that little bit of chair digging into me. Um, so you might have noticed that there's something for you to adjust for yourself. So uh, maybe you notice that you could do with some more coffee to get through the rest of the talk. Or maybe you notice that you're a little hungry and a snack might be helpful. So either way, hopefully you're now been able to check in with yourself and you're feeling better equipped to proceed. Okay, so mindfulness is extremely important because it helps us to tune into this critical distinction for our kids with ADHD. First, when a behavior is a symptom of ADHD and your child actually cannot change what they are doing, for example, humming to themselves, um, or when a behavior is more of a won't and can be changed. So maybe refusing to put their toy in the toy box even though you know they heard your instruction and they're capable of doing this. So in the next part of the talk, I will be talking about behavioral parenting strategies that will be helpful with both the can't behaviors and those won't behaviors. So we can think about strategies for parenting a child with ADHD as a pyramid, <clears throat> with each piece building on each other. So this starts with caregiver, self-care, and self-regulation, and then focusing on developing a positive uh, caregiver-child relationship, then making sure you're setting uh, your child up for success with a supportive structured environment, and then focusing on modifying your own behavior as a parent in relationship to your child, and finally focusing on changing specific child behaviors. So we'll start by talking about caregiver, self-care, and self-regulation. So I often hear from parents and caregivers that they feel guilty about taking time for themselves. And I know that it can be really hard to find the time, especially these days given the added stresses of COVID. However, if you're not functioning as an individual, it's going to be harder for you to show up for your child in a meaningful way. So give yourself permission to put your mask on before you put the mask on of others and to prioritize yourself and your needs from time to time. If you're able to take care of yourself, you may be better able to stay in the moment and to stay regulated and avoid those kind of bigger fires down the road. So let's look at how self-care could play out in the day-to-day. -day. So for example, you might be feeling burnt out and frustrated due to work and other responsibilities, and you haven't been able to take a moment for yourself. And then your child comes home and creates a trigger. They leave their backpack by the door and don't unpack their lunch as you've asked, as you've asked them to do a million times before. So now you start uh, feeling frustrated and you start thinking to yourself, um, I can't believe he can't do this. One thing I've asked him to do to help out, I think he's doing this on purpose just to annoy me. And you notice that your breathing gets more shallow and uh, eventually and you start to get tense muscles, and you start to yell. So I think we've all had those kinds of experiences. And it's important to recognize that all of these pieces kind of build and affect uh, each other. So when, if we want to reduce the number of emotional explosions we have, uh, we can intervene with some self-care strategies at any of these points. So for example, you could try to identify and uh, remove any known triggers. So maybe you just don't want to be at the door the second your child comes home if you've had a hard day. Um, try to notice what goes through your mind and speak kindly to yourself. Watch out for those assumptions and challenge them. Um, bring awareness to your body sensations through mindfulness and try to calm your body with some relaxation strategies. Uh, and try to engage uh, in enjoyable activities or other self-care behaviors. And, and I really want to stress that it's important to plan and schedule these things uh, so you don't forget to prioritize yourself, even if it's for a few minutes. Okay, so moving on to focusing on building the positive parent-child relationship. 
So without the trust and bond uh, between the child and the parent, the strategies that we're going to be discussing after this will not be as impactful and maybe even not even possible to implement. So we know that children with ADHD receive much more negative feedback than their typically developing peers. So it's extremely important to specifically focus on how to increase positive experiences for your child. And a general rule of thumb is to have four positives for every negative. So the first way to strengthen your relationship with your child is to provide frequent praise. This can be nonverbal with smiles and high fives, as well as verbal. And if you're using verbal praise, you want to make sure to be specific and brief. Um, so, for example, instead of saying, good job, saying something like, you did a great job sharing your toy with Sarah. Um, and you want the praise to come as quickly as possible after the action so that your child makes the connection with their behavior. Um, and then you want to praise often. And you want to simultaneously be mindful of reducing negative comments and directions. A really challenging but worthwhile activity to do is to try recording yourself, maybe, for example, during the morning routine, and see how you actually speak with your child. What is your ratio of positive to negatives? Um, often we don't even notice how many commands and criticisms we're actually giving out. Um, and try to only give one... Uh, and try to only give a direction if it's necessary. So if you give direction uh, less frequently, then when you finally do give that direction, it will have more meaning. Um, so try to let things go if they're not important, like, for example, tapping fingers on the table at dinner. Um, and just be aware of that backhanded compliment, which can slip out at times. So next, you want to make sure to schedule child-directed time. This is a special kind of time to spend with your child, different than regular playtime. Think of yourself as a sports commentator and following your child's lead. So you should have no agenda. Um, it's not a time for teaching and you should not be asking questions. Instead, try to make descriptive comments and observations and praise your child's ideas and positive behaviors. This will feel really different at first, but the more you practice, the easier it gets. This is important because it communicates to your child that their ideas are important to you and helps to build their self-esteem and reinforces positive behaviors. So try to schedule this time and make it clear to your child that this is their special time to be in charge, uh, which is different from the rest of the time uh, when the parents are in charge. Um, and then finally, do your best to validate your child's emotions. Let them know that it's okay to feel angry and upset and uh, that you understand why they're feeling that way. We're all entitled to feel our emotions and no one can tell us how to feel. However, certain behaviors and ways of expressing the emotion might be inappropriate. But when emotions are running high, it's not a time for new learning. So try to allow your child the space to calm down by saying something like, I understand that you're feeling angry right now and it's okay to feel that way. You can still maintain boundaries, uh, you know, still not let them have their video game time uh, if that's what they're upset about, um, but, and validate at the same time. And then you can try to address the specific behaviors later once they're calm. Okay, so moving on to setting your child up for success by creating a supportive and structured environment. So you want to create routine and consistent organizational habits as much as possible. We know that children with ADHD uh, who start to practice these habits early on have more success in the future because they learn them like any other skill and, and start to be able to use them more regularly. So do things like you teach them to use calendars, reminders, agendas, and, and how to make to daily to-do lists. Um, and at first, you'll probably be having to do a lot of that for them, but it's helping to teach them for the future. Um, so we know that children with ADHD have difficulty with working memory, so holding information in their minds to then complete a task. So the more we can externalize information and not require them to hold it in their minds, the better. So for example, you can create pictures of your child ready to leave the house and post them. Um, 
so that they're reminded of what done and ready looks like. And then they can use this to figure out what they're missing in the moment. Um, putting up instructions with visual reminders can also be helpful. And we know that children with ADHD have a poor sense of time. And so use timers that, uh, like this time timer that makes time visual for them. Try to shorten or break up routine tasks. So asking your child to clean their room, um, it might be overwhelming for them at first. They might know, not know exactly um, what that means. What does cleaning your room mean? I don't know. Um, or where to start. So by posting these uh, tasks down, broken down with specific instructions, you can help to also take some of the pressure off uh, your own shoulders because you have a list that you can then direct your child towards so they can start to learn to complete these tasks more independently and you don't have to remind them of each task every time. So make sure that your child also has lots of breaks. Um, as we've discussed in previous talks, children with ADHD need to move. Um, so try to have, for example, maybe a movement jar on the homework table um, and have them choose something out of it to get moving. Maybe, maybe they do 10 jumping jacks and then sit back down. And children with ADHD are easily distracted. So do what you can to limit those distractions. Have your child work at a study carol or somewhere similar in your house that maybe visually blocks out distractions. Um, put away distracting toys and opaque bins and hide remote controls. Um, and let them use headphones to block out sound or let them listen to music. Um, and have them sit close to the teacher in class or near you when they're doing homework so you can monitor for any unexpected distractions and redirect your child. And then you want to make sure to create some organization in the environment. So try to have a place for everything uh, if you can. So it's easier for your child to know uh, where things go and where to put them. Um, so, for example, make sure to have a laundry hamper in their room so they know where to put their dirty clothes, um, have hooks for jackets, binders for different subjects, labeled bins for clothes and toys. And even once you've put all of these kind of organizational habits into place, your child will still need frequent prompts and reminders. Because kids with ADHD live in the moment and will continue to get distracted and forget what they are supposed to be doing. So if you're using phone alarms also, just a note that you'll probably need to change the sound of the ringer every once in a while because your child will get used to the sound over time. So try to make it fun and choose songs that your child likes. Okay, so moving on to the parent caregiver behavior. So setting limits is extremely important and children actually really benefit and feel more secure overall when limits are set consistently because they know what to expect. A warning though that if you're going to set a new limit, often behaviors will get worse before they get better. So think about, for example, a fun house. Um, if your child is in there and they're moving around and they're not sure if a wall is actually there or not, they're going to continue to explore and test the limits. And in some cases, they're going to get rewarded for this. For example, they get let into another room that they didn't realize was there. If the walls continue to shift and change, your child will keep pushing and exploring. However, if you set a limit up um, with a firm wall that does not move, no matter how hard your child tries to push, then they will eventually realize that the pushing is not effective. And this is why consistency is really important when it comes to boundary setting. So one really area, important area of uh, setting limits that I just wanted to highlight uh, is screen time. Of course, during COVID, screen time allowances have inevitably gone up. Um, but, and, and it is sometimes maybe important for you, uh, for your own self-care to allow some screen time so you get a bit of a break. Um, but you should overall have some kind of a plan um, and limit set for screens. So I suggest that um, every family creates a family media plan, and I have a link to that in, in the resources for the end of the talk. And there are devices that you can use to help with this. Um, make sure you use passwords, hide controllers, um, and you can try to use the concept of something like a phone sleeping bag um, so that the phone has to be returned to each night. 
And this is one thing that I really stress. If you're going to have one limit set on screens, it should be for bed. Um, so they don't have screens in their room that can interfere with their sleep. So speaking of that consistency and limit setting, you want to do your best to make sure that this happens between caregiver, caregivers as much as possible, across settings, the so school and home, across time, and that you follow through with yourself. So I'm sure you've all had the experience of giving a direction to your child that does not get listened to. And the first step to ensuring that your child follows through on what you've asked is to make sure that you're communicating effectively. Now, before you give a direction, you need to answer a few questions. First of all, is it important? Are we talking about safety with, you know, for example, wearing a seatbelt or something like standing while eating at the dinner table, which might not be that harmful? Um, next, is your expectation fair and realistic? Is your child capable of getting themselves ready for school completely independently? And can you follow through on the consequences if your child does not do what you ask? Um, so maybe you're too tired at the end of the day to follow through on consequences, and that's okay. But if your answer to any of these questions is no, then don't set the expectation or give the direction. It's better to not set an expectation than to set one and then not follow through on it. Now, if you've decided that you do need to give a direction, first make sure to get your child's attention by reducing distractions. So, for example, turn the TV off, touch them gently and get eye contact, use visuals, and ask them to repeat back what you said. Next, when you go, when you are giving your direction, use a calm and neutral voice. Um, keep it short and simple, so just one instruction at a time, and make it firm and direct. So no questions like, do you want to clean your room? Uh, because obviously, uh, the answer to that might be no, and then you have to deal with that. Um, and then you want to clearly detail what the expected behavior is. So tell them what to do as opposed to what not to do. So, for example, say, don't, instead of saying, don't run, say, walk. Um, and you can try using if, when statements as well. So, for example, when you put your plate in the dishwasher, then you can watch your TV show. It's also really important uh, to be clear about when you expect the behavior to be done and what rewards or consequences they will get if the, if the task is completed. And do your best to ignore any protests or arguments. So to understand uh, why it's important to give frequent and immediate feedback, um, I'm going to use the analogy that Dr. Russell Barkley uses. Um, and uh, I want everyone to take a moment to just kind of hold their hands a few inches in front of your faces. Um, so this, this kind of experience of just staring at your hands is similar to how your child experiences the world. They don't really have the ability to look far ahead uh, into, the, into the future. They're kind of more living in that present moment of it, as I've mentioned before. Um, so if you can put your hands down now and think about the difference. So for example, if you were driving, you would be able to see that the light ahead of you was turning yellow and you'd think to yourself, okay, I know that red is gonna come next so I should start to slow down. Whereas a child with ADHD would be confronted all of, all of a sudden with that red light because uh, they're living like this. All of a sudden it would be red light. <laughs> and they wouldn't have that time to prepare. So frequent and immediate feedback also is the reason that your child is likely uh, to be able to focus on video games for hours at a time. They are getting rewards for doing well and their characters are losing health or points if they're not doing well. And this is all happening uh, in the moment as they play. So your challenge is to think about how you can make uh, the day-to-day -day world a little more video game-like for your child and try to think about creating those frequent and immediate uh, feedback opportunities. And finally, try to let go of those unchangeable behaviors. So the table tapping or the constant chatter or wiggling around. Uh, you can do this by giving your child replacement tools like fidgets, by distracting yourself, uh, trying to block your child from your view if they're doing something annoying, um, or just taking a break and letting someone else take over if that's an option for you. 
and then by also using your own relaxation or mindfulness tools. Okay, so lastly, we can think about targeting specific child behaviors for change. So first of all, when we're thinking about how to encourage your child to change their behavior, we want to think about motivation. Individuals with ADHD often lack motivation to do things outside of their interests. And Jessica McCabe, who has a blog called How to ADHD, uh, talks about this with uh, the analogy of the motivation bridge. And that's kind of missing planks. And then she talks about how to fix this motivation bridge by adding those planks back in. And so the planks that she talks about um, that you can add back in are using things that are new and novel, because those are more interesting for your child, um, trying to use rewards, making things more relevant to your child's interests, and adding urgency, so uh, setting deadlines and using timers. And to change specific behaviors, we also have to understand this kind of ABCs of behavior. So every behavior has its antecedents, so what comes before it, the behavior itself, and a consequence. So what happens after the behavior? And that consequence will have an impact on whether the behavior occurs again or not. So the law of effect says that any response followed by a positive consequence is likely to be repeated, and any response followed by a negative consequence is less likely to be repeated. And as we've talked about, we really want to first try to create change for our children by using positive reinforcement before turning to any negative consequences. Also, if you haven't worked on building that relationship with your child, those negative consequences just don't work. You kind of have to build up the, the piggy bank. Um, and so we want to use consequences sparingly. So if you want to increase a specific behavior, for example, maybe you want your child to say please more, you can make a plan to make sure that you praise that specific behavior whenever you notice it. Um, and if you want to decrease a specific behavior um, as well, you can try to maybe first uh, try out the positive approach. So try to flip that behavior into the positive first and uh, try to praise that positive behavior that replaces the negative behavior. Um, so for example, if you don't want your child jumping on the couch, try to praise them for jumping on the mini trampoline that you got um, whenever you prompt them to do that instead. Um, all right, and as we've talked about before, do your best to be consistent and praise whenever you notice these positive behaviors. And a more structured way to increase positive behavior is to use an incentive chart. So when using these kind of reward charts, it's important uh, to make it manageable. Only pick a few behaviors that you're able to monitor and set achievable expectations. And to figure out what's achievable, it's helpful to get an idea of what your child's baseline is. So, for example, how often are they able to brush their teeth on their own without a reminder? If the answer is never, uh, then we don't want to set an expectation that they do this every day uh, for a whole week to earn a reward. So you're just going to be setting them up for failure. Um, and so once you've got a targeted behavior, you want to break it down. Um, and maybe you far start first with prompting your child to pick up their toothbrush uh, when you ask them to. Um, and maybe that's the, the only behavior that you kind of require them to do at first, and then you prompt them throughout the rest of the br teeth brushing process. Um, but later, once they're able to kind of go and get their toothbrush when you ask them to reliably, then you can add on to that behavior. So maybe the next step is that they have to get their toothbrush and they have to put the toothpaste on. Um, and then you reward that whole behavior. So uh, incentive charts should always be changing, both with the expectations and the rewards that you are using. Otherwise, they, they won't work for very long. Um, and it's also helpful to make this visible just to kind of keep that motivation up. And of course, as I keep mentioning, try your best to follow through on noticing the behaviors and providing the rewards. So finally, if there are those specific uh, negative behaviors that you want to decrease, like whining or saying no or yelling, um, you can first try to ignore them, as long as there are no safety concerns. Um, so for example, if your child yells when they want something, you can let them know that you're going to ignore them when they are yelling, uh, but will answer them when they use a quiet voice. 
So you can plan this in advance and let your child know uh, that you're going to be ignoring them. And then in the moment, do your best to stay emotionally neutral, avoid any interaction like eye contact or talking, uh, and try to move away from your child if you can. And then as soon as your child starts to do the desired behavior, like talk in a quiet voice, um, you want to jump in with praise. For example, I like it when you speak in a quiet voice, uh, like I asked. <clears throat> Um, and so this can be a really hard strategy uh, to use. So uh, just a warning to not take this on if you don't have the energy for it. Um, and, and again, just a reminder, you know, if, if you do end up giving in uh, at the height of your child's frustration and emotion, it can in the end make things worse in the long run because they're learning that that upset helps to kind of move that boundary. Um, so really try to take this on when you're feeling like you're, you're full of energy and you can manage it. Okay. Um, and so we save those negative consequences, as I've talked about, for the very last strategies to use. And just a reminder that we use these sparingly. Um, so there are three types. Natural. Um, so, for example, you don't wear your coat. Um, then you're going to be cold. Um, logical. You break something. You have to pay for it out of your allowance uh, for it to be fixed. Um, or loss of privilege. And just a note that with loss of privilege, we recommend that it's no more than 24 to 48 hours at the most. Increasing the length of time that they're going to lose uh, that, that privilege, for example, maybe access to their Xbox, um, it's not going to be more impactful. Um, okay. And of course, as I keep saying, uh, make sure that you're going to give a consequence, you follow through on it. That said, sometimes we do say things that we don't mean in the moment. So if you accidentally blurt out that you're going to take the Xbox away forever, you can correct this and come back and explain that you overreacted. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that you don't do this in response to your child being upset and begging for the Xbox back. Um, you have to do this when your child has already calmed down, and so you're kind of um, portraying that uh, sense of control that the parent is the one um, who's making the decisions. Okay, so last but not least, since we know that children with ADHD have difficulty with self-regulation, it's helpful to directly teach your child skills um, that can help with this. So this is like teaching any other skill in the fact that uh, the more that you practice it, the easier it gets over time. And also note that it's best to practice these skills when your child is already calm, because that's when they're in their best learning mind. We often make the mistake of prompting them to deep breathe, for example, when they're already upset before they've really learned the skill. Um, so you can teach your child to deep breathe in many different ways, using props like bubbles and pinwheels or putting a stuffed animal uh, on their belly so they can see their belly filling up with air and the stuffed animal going up into the air and then coming back down when they breathe out. Um, teaching square breathing techniques, so kind of breathing in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, hold for four seconds, and continuing that pattern. Um, using visualization, so smelling flowers and blowing out candles, um, or doing something like bee, bee breathing, so breathe in, or snake breathing, just to kind of keep it interesting and, and keep your child engaged in that practice. You can also teach some parts of progressive muscle relaxation. So one, one aspect of that that I like to teach that can be done kind of subtly uh, is uh, to kind of visualize uh, holding and squeezing lemons in their hands. So just get them to squeeze, 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 and relax. Okay. You can also try grounding exercises by having your child tap into their senses. So naming five things they can see, four things they can feel, three things they can hear, two things they can smell, and one thing they can taste. And putting together a calm down box is also a good idea with different items um, to tap into those different senses, um, different things to provide them uh, for you to use for distracting activities, um, items to help them uh, deep breathe, and tools to help them express their emotions. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, first of all, at that very base part of the pyramid, uh, you want to make sure that you're taking care of yourself um, and that you're learning to self-regulate. 
Um, and then you want to prioritize those positive experiences for your child. So praise immediately and frequently, reduce negative feedback and directions, create child-directed time, and validate emotions. And then you want to do your best to accept what you can't change. So create consistency and structure, provide support, um, and focus on what matters and then let go of if it's not important. And then change what you can. So set limits, follow through, communicate clear expectations, use specific targeted praise and rewards or ignoring and consequences to increase or decrease specific behaviors, um, and then cultivate those self-regulation skills. So I'm just going to remind you that at the beginning of this talk, I challenge you to just uh, to maybe take one or two SMART goals away from today. Uh, just a couple of things to focus on that you might be able to start working on um, and, and to make that specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. So uh, maybe take a moment right now to think about if there's one or two things that you might be able to take away from today and maybe jot those down somewhere. Um, and then I'll just briefly show you that I do have some resources and they are going to be uh, sent out uh, with the slides. So I won't spend too much time going over this. So we have a bit of time for questions, but we have some mindfulness resources, um, some suggestions for different um, parenting programs, oh, uh, oh, parenting, uh, parents, this parenting specific resources, and then some support groups and websites. Um, okay, oh, and a few books, and Jessica McCabe's blog as well. Those will all be included, um, and then we have some time for questions and answers. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gillis. That was an information-packed presentation with lots of practical tips for parents. So thank you so much. And as mentioned, we will be putting a link to both the slides and the recording. Uh, you'll get that in an email tomorrow, and we'll include the resources in the email that you'll receive as well. Okay, so we have lots of questions, which is fantastic. I've been reading through them during the presentation. We'll get to as many as we can today. Um, if we don't have a chance to get to your question, uh, please don't hesitate to email us at the Kelty Center, and we'd be happy to support you and provide information and resources um, that way. We'll put our contact information up um, near the end of the presentation. So um, with no further ado, we'll get into the questions. We can get to as many as possible. So the first one is from a, a parent of a nine-year-old boy who excels at school, which is fantastic, um, but he really struggles when he gets home from school and tends to have quite a few meltdowns once he's at home. So getting mad, frustrated really easily, um, and if the parent tries to calm him down, he just shuts down, hides his face, um, hits himself with pillows. So what tools and coping skills can this parent offer their, their son? That's a great question and a really uh, common experience, I would say. Um, I think uh, often kids are at school and they're really doing their best to keep it together and then they come home to the safe space and then that's when everything comes out. So the first thing I would actually do is just investigate a little bit more to see what's going on at school to see if there's any kind of pressures that can be reduced there. There may be too much work being assigned or something like that. Um, so yeah, really making sure that you're communicating with the school to find out what the day is looking like there. Um, and then um, and then I think um, kind of going back to some of the things I was talking about with emotion regulation skills, trying to teach some of those in advance when your child is calm. So maybe they might be um, helpful in the moment when their emotions are starting to get to, to rise and seeing if you can identify any of those specific triggers is it you know the second he comes in the door and he's really melting down does he have a few moments beforehand and then it's something at home that can kind of trigger it um, um, and yeah it's kind of it's a bit of a hard question to answer more uniquely to your specific child, but um, I think trying to think of, are there some positive experiences that you could have ready for him when he first comes in the door um, that, that might fit with his specific interests um, so that he can have that time to really uh, calm down, making sure there's some space for him to um, have that decompression time. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's kind of 
all that I'll say about that for now so we can get to some others. Um, I know that's not that specific, but that might be something um, for you to discuss as well with um, maybe therapist or someone to kind of figure out where those like points of intervention are and what specific things could be changed. Great, thank you. So the next question is from a parent who is wondering if you can suggest some organizational strategies for parents who also have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I mean, a lot of the things that I mentioned already in the talk uh, can apply to parents as well. So that idea of like having a place for everything, trying to have some organization, you know, like a bowl for your keys by the door so that you get into the habit of, okay, that's where my keys go when I come in the door. Um, there are some resources that I provided on the slides that um, uh, have some uh, adult um, ADHD suggestions. So you might be able to access some of those. There are definitely lots of support groups out there for adults with ADHD as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's kind of the things that I did suggest in the talk do are, are applicable to adults as well. Um, and, uh, and trying to find someone that maybe can help you with that to organize yourself if you have if a partner or a friend, uh, a parent, someone that maybe can help you to put, implement some of those strategies. Um, and then Jessica McCabe, who I mentioned as well, in particular, she has some really great uh, blog videos. And I think Dr. Chan played some of her videos in his talk. Um, and uh, she's an adult with ADHD, and she speaks a lot to kind of specifically um, strategies that helped her. Um, so I would really recommend checking her out and watching some of her videos. Um, <clears throat> she does specifically address the organizational strategies in some of them as well. Great. So the next question is from a parent who is um, asking about how setting limits and following through generates more anger and their child becomes more physical. So yelling, throwing or breaking things. So how do they manage this anger when they try to set limits and follow through? Yeah, yeah, that's really tough. And I think, I mean, uh, a caveat to all of those suggestions are if, if, uh, safety is involved, right? And sometimes you have to intervene uh, to make sure that everyone's going to be staying safe. Um, and um, I think, uh, again, the there are lots of things that are going to make it hard to be consistent, right? And so I, I will acknowledge again that this is kind of the the recommendation and you do your best to, to try and follow through. Um, I think sometimes it feels like we're being consistent, but maybe um, we're not kind of realizing, you know, I've talked to parents before where, uh, for example, they don't even realize that they asked their child to like hand over the phone and then the phone didn't get handed in and then, <laughs> um, and then the child has kind of broken that, um, that uh, or push the boundary. Um, so I think I would I might actually recommend my suggestion of recording yourself so just to kind of see how things are playing out between the two of you um, and try to see if if you are actually um, able to pick one behavior where you stick to that and see if that one behavior might change over time with uh, those limits being set because like I said in the one slide, um, that the behaviors will get worse before they get better. And so if you are sticking those boundaries on and your child has learned over a course of time that getting upset and, and works, and I'm not saying that they're necessarily doing that on purpose, but or, or mindfully, or um, but they might have learned through the interactions that their em big emotions are getting them what they want. And so... Um, I would kind of go back to that and think about um, is there uh, some way that you can uh, pick just one behavior to try and be consistent on and, and actually see is once you get through that period of the upset and the pushback and they start to realize that, okay, this isn't working, then you might actually start to see some change. But sometimes that process of getting through that can be really, really hard and you might need extra support and, uh, and maybe seeing uh, someone who can support you with, uh, with 
implementing those boundaries, um, having some uh, an extra another caregiver who's able to step in as well. Um, um, and I guess all of that said, you're wanting to make sure that all that praise and all the positive stuff is happening before you're setting those limits and those boundaries. So you kind of have that piggy bank built up. Um, so yeah, again, it's kind of hard to know exactly without knowing specifically what your situation is. Um, uh, but sometimes there are behavioral interventions out there that can help to pinpoint specifically where things are breaking down and um, and it might be an idea to access some of that support. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so the next one is one that we um, get a lot of questions about at the Healthy Center as well, and that's related to siblings. Um, so do you have any advice for how to manage siblings who don't need the same level of intervention and so you're not having any child feel singled out in a negative way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so often if we're doing some kind of reward system, um, you might not target the same behaviors, but you can still set up a reward system for the other sibling to work on something else. And it might not ha be as vital or important, but, um, but those kinds of systems and using rewards can be helpful for any child, right? It's not just for kids with ADHD. So I don't think it hurts to, to put that into place just so that it seems like there are expectations for both children. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, I think that child-directed time that I mentioned, um, really planning that out so that if you can have both child children kind of having some time one-on-one -on -one with, with each parent um, and maybe swapping and, and having them have that special time, um, because what can happen, and I'm sure um, a lot of you experience that, the child with ADHD gets a lot of the attention, right? And so trying to plan in advance that, okay, but I'm still going to make sure that the other child is getting attention, we're gonna kind of swap and just be mindful of that. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers the question, but <laughs> it's, it is challenging with siblings. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is from a parent who is wondering about um, different parenting styles across split families. And the question is, um, how effective are all of these strategies in split families where only one parent is kind of actively working with the child and the other is not even willing to admit that their, their child has ADHD? So is the stability of the accepting home making a positive difference for the child or any other tips you can provide for that type of situation? Yeah, another common and great question. Um, so I would say doing what you can in your environment is is better than not doing anything at all, of course, right? So um, ideally we want as much consistency between households as possible, but sometimes that's just not possible. And so I think just trying your best to kind of take ownership and, and your uh, of your space and your environment um, and your child will start to learn, right, that, um, okay, when I'm at this household, this is how things go. And their behavior might be different, and you might get some kind of spillover from coming back from the other household that maybe is less structured. Um, but uh, uh, that's, I mean, that even happens within the same household, right? Children start to learn like, okay, well, I know I can push mom a little bit more than dad or vice versa, so I'm going to go to them when I want something. So. Um, so I think you do your best to be consistent, um, but if you can't have that consistency or the other parent's not on board, you just do what you can to do it on your own, and there will be um, some positive impacts, um, e even though, yeah, it's not the ideal situation, but that's life, right? It's not, yeah. 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 Okay. So I think we have time for one or two more questions. We'll see um, what we get to. Um, but there's been actually a few questions about um, using these strategies in teenagers or what might be most effective for teens. So do you have any tips for teens, especially as they are expected to be more independent at school and in other areas of life? Great question. So yes. And uh, I think, well, the general principles of what I said still apply to teenagers. Um, however, it's just going to look a little bit different. So, you know, if you take a basic example of like fidgets, right, you're maybe not going to have them playing with a fidget spinner, but maybe they bring, make sure to bring their water bottle to class. And that's something that they can have and hold. Um, I think um, uh, you, in to the teenage years, it's really 
uh, important that they start to have more of that independence. Um, and you want to kind of play that out. But I think the main, one of the main messages being that in order to gain that independence or be able to, you know, have privileges that maybe they want to have, they kind of have to show that they're capable of that. Um, and so that might be kind of a way it's like um, a reward system that's maybe not as young, <laughs> um, but you're saying, okay, well, if you want to have the privilege of uh, driving the car, you have to make sure that you fill it back up with gas when you return it at the end of the night every day, right? So you're still using some of those contingencies. It just looks a little bit different um, and it's more age appropriate. Uh, yeah. Okay. And are you okay if we squeeze on one more question? Um, great. Okay, so the last question is, how can we determine if the behavior is from a skills deficit? So we can shape behavior with rewards or punishment, but if the task exceeds the child's ability, um, it will, they won't be successful. So just more about how to make that determination. Yeah. So yeah, I would say, um, okay, this, it's not an easy determination to make um, all the time. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to learn as much as you can about ADHD, the more that you kind of understand the disorder and what the common kind of uh, impairments are, the more you're going to be able to see that in your child and understand when it's more ADHD related. So it's great that you're um, here today and learning more about it. Um, I think also, you are going to know your child best in terms of what their abilities are. And so I think part of it is um, asking yourself, okay, what have I been able to see them do? So first part is like, is this part commonly part of ADHD and for, is, as, um, as I understand it and the knowledge that I have about it, right? Is this a, an impulsive thing? Is this, can this be understood um, because they're being distracted easily? Those kinds of things. Um, and then the other piece is just, uh, also knowing your child, right? Have you been able to see them do that behavior all consistently multiple times? And then this one time you've done everything right, you've like got their attention, you've communicated clearly, you've done all those pieces, and then they're outwardly saying, no, I'm not going to do it. Then that's maybe more of the, the kind of defiant, I don't want to do this kind of behavior. So I think you want to Think about ADHD and what you understand about it. Think about what you know of your child. Um, and then ask yourself, have I kind of done everything that I need to do here to kind of, you know, communicate clearly, make sure that my child is um, not hungry or tired or <laughs> that um, there's some other maybe explanation for that behavior. Um, obviously, if they can do something, they've demonstrated that multiple times, there might still be times that they just is like actually can't do it maybe because they're tired um, or they're really hungry or there's something else going on. So ask yourself those questions and then if it's still like, yeah, I think it's just seems really like we've done all these things um, and then maybe that's, uh, that's when you kind of think, okay. But I would, for the most part overall, give the benefit of the doubt and think this is probably more of a skills deficit unless you kind of have gone through all of those questions and come out the other side and said, no, I think this is actually, he's, he's uh, not uh, um, doing what I'm asking him to do on purpose. Great. Thank you so much. So it's one o'clock. So I know most people have to um, go. So thank you so much, Dr. Gillis, for all the information today and for taking the time to answer all these questions um, after the presentation. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined today and taking the time to be with us. Um, just as a reminder, there will be a survey that will pop up after the presentation. So if you could fill that out, that would be super helpful for us in, in terms of planning future webinars. Um, and if we didn't have a chance to get to your question, again, feel free to contact us at the Kelty Center. Center. Uh, Dr. Gillis, if you can just go to the very last slide um, that has our contact information on it, uh, so folks can jot it down if they would like to. There's our email address, uh, our, our toll-free phone number from anywhere in BC, so feel free to call us or email us, and we'd be happy to support you by email or phone. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Gillis, and I hope everyone has a, a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.